how do you know that you will be taken in the rapture? How can you be certain? Now, let, let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you some things tonight, and we're going to get deep into this. You're going to leave with more information than you'll remember, but you're going to probably leave remembering this study for the rest of your life because the rapture's tomorrow. And you only have one more date. No, last study I'll ever do. No, I, I don't know that, but it, it is going to be memorable for those of you that don't understand this topic. Now, I'm going to explain something to you. The Bible definitely teaches meeting the Lord in the air. So 100%, the Bible teaches a rapture. Um, you can't believe the Bible and not believe in the rapture because it says it. I mean, it says it in clear words that you'll be caught up. Now, it's not that Christians don't believe it, even though there are Christians that hold doctrines that don't believe it, even though you can't really, you're, you're holding false doctrines because it's 100% it's clear in Scripture. It's un, indisputable that there is a rapture. But, and, and, and just because the word, um, that particular word isn't used, but to be caught away, to be caught up. And, and there's been many times where um, you've seen people caught up. Elijah was caught up. Enoch was caught up. Philip, the evangelist, was sideways caught up. He actually disappeared and ended up in a different location. And, and so there's these, these stories in the Bible that are quite unique. Now, if God is saving the world with an end times church, he doesn't just have a family, Noah's family, on a boat. God has to have a much bigger method to rescue from the wrath to come, to rescue the redeemed, especially when there are millions of redeemed. God's plan has always been to rescue the redeemed from the wrath. He rescued Lot from the wrath of Sodom and Gomorrah. He rescued Noah from the wrath of the world's destruction. And so that is his plan. That is the way he do, does things. That's like God. That's the way he does it. So on the final destruction, the book of Revelation, he's doing the same thing. He always does the same thing. He rescues, he delivers from the wrath to come. In fact, the book of Thessalonians says that we will be delivered from the wrath to come. There's a verse that says that. So there's no doubt that he's rescuing the church. There's no doubt they will be delivered. Now people say, well, we're gonna be immune to it. The, the stings of the scorpions and the meteors that fall and um, the plagues that happen, we're gonna go through it, but we're gonna be immune to it because we're gonna be, have divine protection. You know, people have all these things, who, you know, ideas of how it can happen when they don't believe in a, in a rapture. But it's impossible to read the Bible and not believe in the rapture because it says it so clearly. But for most Christians, and almost all Christians do believe in the rapture, but they believe it at different timings. They think, well, it's at the very end because the Bible says the last trump. Well, it's at the beginning because in Revelation chapter 4, John heard the angel say, come up here and was caught up and there was a door open in heaven and then the end times began and, and, and was shown to him. And John was the beloved and, and representing, representing God's favorite. You know, Abraham had a favorite, right? Who was that? No, Jacob had a favorite. N not, not, let's see, Jacob's? No, mm, I'm getting a little confused here. Joseph was the favorite of Jacob, okay? And he got the coat of many colors, right? John was favored among the disciples, wasn't he? John the beloved. John is the one that gets to get raptured. The one who's favored among the disciples gets to have his own personal rapture experience. Come up here. He hears the angel, so he gets caught up in the spirit, he says. And then all of a sudden, he sees from heaven's vantage point all the things that are gonna take place on the earth. So who are the type of people who get raptured? 
What do they do that makes them a rapturable person? And then you're going to wonder, maybe, does Pastor John have false doctrine? Because why would anything other than being saved be all that you need as far as to be a rapturable person? That's not really a word. I just made that one up tonight, okay? And so... So from what I'm looking at in Scripture, from what I can see in Scripture, it is a select group of people from the church that will be raptured. You have the ten virgins, ten wise, ten foolish. The five wise go to the wedding feast. The door is shut on the other five. Book of Revelation, seven churches. I'll keep you from, Revelation 3, Philadelphia church, I'll keep you from the hour of trial, which will try all of them that dwell on the earth. Other church, I'm threatening to throw you into the great tribulation unless you repent. Talking to a church. That means, then then that means in Revelation, you'd have to see Christians in there, and you do. And we call them, we call them tribulation saints because they're the people who are getting saved or were saved. So then our salvation is based on one thing. Our salvation is based on belief in Jesus Christ and that Jesus died for our sins, that Jesus rose again from the dead, and you have eternal life. You're promised eternal life. But my question is, were you thinking if Pastor John has some false doctrine? My question is, you may be born again and you may have eternal life, but is that your same ticket in for the rapture? Is everybody who's saved going in the rapture? And according to the Bible, the answer is no. Five foolish virgins, the church that's being threatened to be thrown by Jesus into the great tribulation. There's going to be people who don't make it. There are going to be church members. If you're a Calvinist, you would say, well, those are the church members that were just going to church and they weren't really saved. How do you know that? How do you know that they weren't really saved? How do you not know that maybe they were backslidden and they weren't relying on the Lord? And and so the point that I'm making is, is if I'm right, if every Christian's not going to be raptured, but only the ones who are ready and looking and waiting and watching and alert, all those things that Jesus said to do, to be looking for his appearing, only the ones who are looking for his appearing will he appear a second time. So if, if you don't care about his appearing, you're not thinking, oh, Jesus is coming back, and I'm trying to be ready for Jesus coming back. Now, I'm sure there's a person like that that will make it in the rapture, because maybe they're ignorant, but they're totally pleasing to God. But there are other people who are just kind of going their merry way. As a Christian, I have no need. I'm happy, I'm full, I'm rich. And that was one of the churches, Sardis, in the book of Revelation, that they had it all, and they needed nothing. But I'm going to tell you something. We need the rapture. And, and, and I'll tell you why I'm not scared for, to possibly be wrong and to even having taught you the wrong thing. Because first of all, there's people who don't even believe in the rapture, so who cares what they think that I'm doing? Then Christians all have different views on the rapture. No, it's coming at the end of the tribulation. It's coming in the middle of the tribulation. It's coming at the beginning of the tribulation. So everybody's got it all confused and everything, right? Even though the majority of Christians believe it's gonna happen, they just don't know when it's gonna happen. So therefore, now I'm, I'm describing a nuance of being caught up a nuance in standing in the presence of the Son of Man. And that nuance is, who makes it? How do you make it? How do you become one that goes in the rapture? Is it automatic because you're born again? Or is it not automatic because you're born again? And I've gone back and forth with this over the years, and I still don't know for a fact. Okay, I still don't know for a fact. But from what I was studying on this, it has like an appearance that maybe it's not completely automatic for the Christian. And so many times, even as a pastor, if I sin in some way, that I'll say, Lord, forgive me, and Lord, I wouldn't want to miss a rapture. It'd be a very sad thing if a pastor miss miss a rapture. And then I'll pray for the church. Lord, let everybody in our church go in the rapture. Because I kind of have the fear of God regarding the rapture of the church. And the fact that not everybody's going to go. But there's a possibility of missing the rapture. When I was a kid, 
I learned about the rapture. I went to vacation Bible school, and there was that one song, and the line in the song is, you've been left behind, you've been left behind. And it's like, wow, that's the most horrifying thought that you could ever have, of being left behind if the Lord is coming for his church, he came for his church, and how many times have I thought maybe the rapture happened, and I'm praying a last minute prayer, Lord, please, <laughs> you know, catch me up, don't, don't let me be left behind, I, you know, and, and so some people say, well, that's horrible, that's a horrible Christian existence, why would you want to have the fear of being left behind, and why would you torment yourself like that, and why would you, you know, it's like, just, no, you're a Christian, all Christians are going. I don't think they have scripture to prove that all Christians are going. I don't think it's a salvation issue. I think it has other issues associated with it that we're going to look at tonight. So let's go ahead and open the Bible to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 5. It says, by faith, Enoch was taken away. Hmm. Enoch was not so long after Adam. Enoch was taken to heaven a little bit before Noah was born, quite a bit before the flood actually happened, because the flood didn't happen until Noah was 600. But Enoch was taken away. So forget the timing between Enoch being taken away and the flood, but the truth is, is that when we look at this scripture in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, it mentions big stories. It mentions Enoch was taken away. And then the next story it mentions in Hebrews chapter 11 is Noah went on the ark. And, you know, we, we've got the end times at that time there. So Enoch was taken away. Then um, the, the wrath of God came. Okay? So I believe that if Noah even represented people riding through it and then repopulating the earth afterwards, and Enoch represented the faithful who got to go, then, then what is it about Enoch? Even if I'm wrong, even if I'm wrong, but what is it about Enoch that would make him be raptured? It says that he was taken away. Look at this. Hebrews 11, verse 5. By faith, something to do with Enoch's faith, Enoch was taken away. Enoch had faith in God he believed that God existed, and he was taken away. Okay, so that would give one point for salvation, because people who have salvation believe that God exists, right? So, so, so if you're going in the rapture just because you're saved, then great, praise God, then everybody's just going in the rapture. And I hope that's, I actually hope that would be the, the correct um, case on that one. But it says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. Do you see that there? He did not see death. But the Bible says it's appointed for man to die once, and then comes the judgment. So if it's appointed for man to die once, how could somebody not see death? Correct. God has a general rule. The general rule is you're born and you die. In between, you pay taxes. And that's life, right? But God, who supersedes nature and even death, because he had victory over death, he's able to bypass the general rule and make somebody not see death. And so God can take a generation of people who are born again within mankind that are a bunch of little Enoch's walking around who are people who have faith in God and they also could have this end times experience of not seeing death. There's some very interesting things about Enoch we're gonna learn tonight, okay? It says he was taken away so that he did not see death. Where was he taken? Was he taken to a mountaintop? Where was he taken that he wouldn't see death? It says, and he was not found. Enoch, where are you? Are you hiding? All the, all the auction free. He was not found because God had taken him. Like God snatched him. God took him. 
The Bible talks about Jesus being the thief in the night. The Bible talks about your household being broken into, meaning you would really want to protect your family and you would really want your family to be saved. It's kind of an interesting analogy the way it's worded. But Jesus comes as a thief. So God had taken him. Jesus will take his flock from the earth. It says, for before he was taken, he had this testimony. So what was Enoch's testimony? What was it that would make Enoch takeable by God, rapturable by God? He had this testimony. I'm going to tell you what. I want Enoch's testimony. Whether I'm wrong that you have to have that testimony in order to be raptured, or whether we all just have that testimony because we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and love not our lives unto death, whatever, if, if just the fact that we hold the testimony of Christ is enough, and that you're going to think that, well, Pastor John is teaching a works-based rapture, I'll never teach in a million years, or even a gazillion years, a works-based salvation. But I am thinking that rapture does not equal salvation. It just, all it equals is early transport. It equals early transport. But I'll tell you what, I would rather have early transport. Anybody want early transport? So if you want early transport, whether you get it just because you're saved, or whether you get it because you hold the testimony of Enoch. And what is that testimony? It says he had a testimony that he pleased God. Well, I'll tell you what, even if I'm wrong, that can't be a te- bad testimony to strive for. Oh, but that's work-based to try to please God. It's all works. That's all trusting in your works. If I have to trust in pleasing God to be raptured, I, I don't think I will ever go to hell. I absolutely believe in God and what Jesus did for me for my salvation. I don't earn it. I don't deserve it. It's, it's Christ-based alone. But the Enoch thing, the rapture, if his testimony was that he pleased God, then what is it? What is it? How do you please God like that? Now, obviously, the first thing you could ever do to please God is to believe in his son. I don't know what that is. I just got like this text on my arm. Get this thing off of me. There we go. Okay. Um, so, he pleased God. Now, now check this one out. It says in verse 6, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. So then we know a cue, a clue. His faith was something that was pleasing to God. Because without faith, you can't please God. So if you operate through faith, I'm, I'm doing this by faith, God. I'm trusting you by faith. I'm trying to overcome the world by faith. I am loving you by faith. I'm being born again by faith. If everything is through faith, that faith, even if it's a mustard seed, will please God, right? So by faith, he was raptured, it says, right? He was taken by God. And then it says, it says, because God had taken him, for before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. Now, impossible. Have you ever found things in your God, in your walk with the Lord, hard to do, hard to overcome things, hard to overcome obstacles, hurdles, and, and sins, and all that kind of stuff. Have you ever found things hard? You know you're forgiven. You know you're born again. You've seen changes here and there, and you've seen, but, 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 but you've still got this part of you that's, you know, the little monster part of you. And so, so here we go. He, he did something here. He says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. There are, in our, in, our, in our striving, in our flesh, it's impossible to please God on our own. We can only do it by faith. We can only do it by reliance and trust and, and absolute dependence on him. So, so when it comes to overcoming the world in which we are fighting, you know, the good fight of faith to overcome the world, and so that the way the end of our faith would be the salvation of our soul— and we're, we're, we're doing this, but by faith, it says by faith, he found that, that, that it's impossible to please him. So, this, so he was a man of faith. 
Now, do we muster up faith? Do we push it out? Is it coming out of my pores? Or do I have a heart of trust, a heart of reliance, a heart of dependence? Is Jesus on my tongue? Am I calling out, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. I trust you, Jesus. Deliver me, Jesus. Help me to overcome, Jesus. Even if you don't overcome, are you calling out to Jesus? Is everything, you know, by faith in your life, right? Because there's a lot of impossible things, a lot of impossible mountains. Um, Kirsty, wherever you are, I don't know. She was maybe with the baby in the baby room. Um, you know, impossible mountains to climb, but by faith, we can make melt, mountains melt. By faith, we can leap over a wall. We can come against a troop. And by faith, I mean, like, we can speak to that mountain and say, be thou removed and be cast into the sea. And so the impossible, I'm just a guy. You're just a girl. You can't do it. But by faith, we're trusting God in our life to do that. That's his, that was his testimony. A raptured man. Would you rather follow a raptured man's testimony or some theologian that's saying, well, you know, it, it really, that's works-based and here's salvation, which is the free gift and they're both one the same. I don't know. Transport and death to enter into eternal life maybe are two different things. Rapture is just transport. It's transportation. Salvation is eternal life. So, so the guy who had transportation, he had God wills. That's the rapture, is God wills. The guy who had God wills, that guy pleased God. He had a testimony, and, and he knew that without faith it was impossible to please him. It says, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. You got to like totally believe, I come to your throne room of grace, God. You are there. Do you totally believe that he is? Or do you kind of not think, you know? So, so, and I'm not talking about a person who has a lapse of faith, or a person who has casual doubts. But for the person who lives in regular doubt, would that be a person who comes to God and believes that he is? I don't think so. If you're always walking in doubt, then maybe you're really not believing that he is. But here, here we go. Here's more information. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Mm. Salvation is a free gift, but rapture is a reward. Hmm. Maybe not everybody gets that reward. We don't all get the same rewards, do we? So he's a rewarder, and, and this is all, all this whole verse is around Enoch, okay, and the rapture. So he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if you're seeking him, you're pleasing him by faith, but you're, there's an earnestness, there's an urgency, there's a desperateness, there's a laborious diligence in seeking him. It's not like just come to church on Sunday. So maybe the just come to church on Sunday Christian, unless, of course, they're elderly and they can't be involved and be a part of the flock and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we're not talking about the elderly or the sickly, but the, the Sunday Christian might not be the one who's diligently seeking him. They're, they're saved. They believe in Jesus and they, they know they should go to church once a week. But there's probably going to be a lot of Christians left behind, in the rap, left behind from the rapture. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to be. I want to be one that my testimony was I diligently sought the Lord. So even if I was wrong and the rapture was only salvation-based, not pleasing God-based and diligently seeking him-based, and it wasn't an, an Elijah testimony, uh, or Enoch testimony. It wasn't an Enoch testimony. And I do hope I'm wrong, as I said before, but I, I'll tell you what, I'm still going to try to have that Enoch testimony, okay? I, I think... I want to make sure that I don't make a mistake and that these guys over here, no, no, your salvation equals rapture. If they're wrong, I don't want to take a chance missing the rapture. I want to diligently seek him. 
What does that mean to you? What does that mean to any of us to diligently seek him? You know what? I saw Aaron in men's study last night. Melissa was here on Tuesday for the women's. Some of our young adults sitting over there were there last Friday with the young adults. One of the things I noted tonight is that on Wednesday night, there are a lot of people that are diligently seeking the Lord. So they're not just Sunday Christians. So I know that that, you know, could sound like um, classes of Christians. Well, you're the Sunday Christian, and you're the diligently seek Christian. Well, even if there were classes of Christians, not for salvation, but if the rapture were a reward, because what did it say? It says he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So, if the rapture is a reward, I want that reward. I hope for that reward. I will feel comforted having that reward. It will be a blessing to me. I mean, Paul said, if you want to talk about a lack of confidence in somebody who knew the Bible upside down and backwards, he said, if by any means I might attain the resurrection of the dead. So if you want to, you know, fault me tonight for telling you that I'm thinking the rapture might be a reward and not just salvation-based, but it might have to do with pleasing God and having a testimony. Well, Paul said some really lack of confidence statement there, if by any means I, yeah, he, he knew who the Lord was, but maybe he knew himself too. And he recognized things about himself that were faulty and maybe could depart from the Lord because any of us could not to ever be high-minded. Matthew 24, 36. Matthew 24, 36. Man, I'm telling you, I've got so much here, but we've got very limited time. But, but, it, but you know what? This was communion night, so we're allowed to take a little bit of extra time. Okay? Because we took communion at first. So, okay, so Matthew 24, 36. It says, but of, of, is that 36? Yeah. Ooh. You know, I'm thinking it starts at verse 35, but we'll see, we'll see. I think I lost the verse I wanted. Somebody read, put their verse 35 on here, please, um, Rodina. I'm wondering if I messed up here. Okay, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Put verse 34. But of that day and hour knows no one but the angels of heaven and my father. Okay, okay. So verse 36, it says, but of that day and hour, no, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. Okay, that day and that hour, no one knows. At the, during the tribulation period, the book of Revelation gives actual number of days that you can count down to the end. It says this many thousand days here and that many thousand days there. It actually gives days so you can go, oh, okay, so this is the end when the Lord should be coming back. It actually gives the amount of days there. So if this one says nobody knows the day or the hour, then it must be at the beginning. It must be, you know, where you don't have countdown days that the book of um, Revelation talks about. So of the day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, my father only. Now Jesus does know now, though, because it says the judge is standing at the door in James. So he does know now. He didn't know then because he was 100% human then, even though he was also 100% God. But the 100% human part didn't know. Okay? So it says in verse 37, it says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Like life was going on as normal. Okay? And it says, and they were eating and drinking and marrying. And then verse 39, it says, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away so that Oh, I see what I did here. Oh, took them all away so that they will, um, took them all away. Didn't know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Now, in this particular thing, left during Noah's time would meant that you got flooded away. Taken would have meant you were in the ark. Some people say taken here means because there's a verse that talks about where the um, 
carcasses. There the birds will be also. And so they, these are people who died for judgment, the ones taken away. So there, there's arguments about this. But it, it, it seems that even though the word even taken away is talking about the flood earlier there, we know if somebody's left on the earth, you're taken into the great tribulation. So in this particular story, the taken away, two men will be in a field. One will be taken, the other left. Taken where? Left where? One, one left right there on earth, and the other's taken. Two women will be grinding at a mill. One will be taken, the other left. Verse 42, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Coming, he's coming, and he's going to take his church. So the taking there is taking his people. You don't know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Be ready to be taken by Jesus as God took Enoch. Be aware of your household too. Then there's another scripture, and it's in the book of Luke, chapter 21. Go ahead and turn there. Luke 21. This is actually the verse I was looking for, why I kept having to change the verses there, because I was thinking we were in Luke, but we were in Matthew. Luke 21, verse 34, it says, but take heed to yourselves. Why does the Bible tell you to take heed to yourself? Why do we have to watch out for ourselves? Why do I have to care about, like Paul said to Timothy, um, after... Well, he said, actually, in Corinthians, he said, after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Why did he say things like that? Why did he tell Timothy that you'll save both yourself and those who hear you? Why? Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts, he's talking about his, he's talking to the, the people of God. Lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life and that day come upon you unexpectedly. So what would that mean in, a, in his disciples? What would that mean in the, the children of Israel, the people of God? What would that mean for them, for him to come unexpectedly in their life? It says, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Kind of like we're seeing one of the plagues on the face of the whole earth, right? And we got to really pray for India, don't we? Because our, our missionaries, the Beltrans that are over there right now, are trying to get back because it's, you know, they, they need to get back right now because it's getting so bad over there. And everybody is dying over there. Everybody, every family has somebody dying. People are dropping dead in the streets as you walk. And that's not an exaggeration. That's how bad it's going right now. Yeah, look up India. It, they're just dying from the coronavirus that badly right now. Unlike here, something unseen. It says, for it will come as a thief snare to those who dwell on the face of the earth. Watch therefore and pray always. Look at this. What's going to happen on the earth? The end times. Watch therefore because the end times is going to happen. Because it's going to happen unexpectedly. And pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I've always stumbled over that verse a little bit because I feel so contradictory because I thought that my salvation equaled rapture, even though maybe it still does. But I thought that my salvation equaled rapture. But why does that sound so works-based? Pray that you're accounted worthy. Why should, I don't have to pray that I'm saved. Lord, please let me really be saved. I know I'm saved. I believed in Jesus Christ. But he's talking about the rapture there, you see? And he says, pray that you're accounted worthy to escape the tribulation. Pray that you're allowed, that you're, you're worthy to be taken out of it. Pray that you're accounted worthy. And so you know what? Even though I couldn't reconcile my salvation doctrine with my rapture doctrine, I couldn't. I couldn't reconcile them. They seem like two totally different things. And so since I didn't understand it, and I still might be wrong, but I tell you what, I'm still going to do what Jesus said. I'm going to pray I'm accounted worthy. Jesus, please let me be worthy through your blood, through faith, through testimony, through let me be worthy 
to escape these things. Not to go to heaven for salvation, but to escape the tribulation period. Be one of those people that get to be in the white robes standing there. It's like, whoa, we're here. Wow, we're here. Rather than one of the people that's left on earth, part of the church that's left on earth and going, oh no, I'm here. I don't want to be here. I want to be there. Where do you guys want to be? Here or there? Okay? To escape these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Man. Matthew 24, 45. Matthew 24, 45, it says, Who then is faithful and a wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Oh, works-based, works-based, that the master is coming and he finds you teaching, giving them food in due season, feeding the hungry. You're serving God. So he sees that you were faithful when he comes. I want to be faithful when he comes. I want to be faithful when he comes. Whether we're hiding out in a cave because we can't have Bible studies in public. I want to, I don't know, we'll have to dig a cave in the Whittier Hillside. Um, I want to be faithful when he comes. Verse 47, Assuredly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. Reward, reward. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, if that evil Christian, born again Christian, servant of God, says in his heart, well, you know, the Lord's not coming right now. And he begins to beat his fellow servants. You're beating up your brothers and sisters in church. I see some bruises on some of you. It says he beats his fellow servants and to eat and to drink with the drunkards. The master of that born-again servant, I'm, I'm throwing that word in because the way Jesus talks there, it sounds like it's a servant. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. I thought nobody knows the day or the hour anyway. How could we be aware of it? Let me tell you what we're aware of. We are aware of the signs of the times. You can discern the weather and you can't discern the times. I think we're beginning to discern the times that we're at the precipice. Even if it's eight years or 10 years or three years or one year or tomorrow, we can see that the world is very much antichrist and very much being prepared for the antichrist. And that's the world that we're living in. And Israel is very much there, who's an, who is a, um, a game player for the last days. Verse 49 of Matthew 24, it says, and this, he begins to be a servant. Um, servant, he comes on a day that he's not looking, Verse 51, it says, and he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So meaning that there, there could be the person who is the hypocrites, they're there in the tribulation, and they're going to be weeping and going, uh, been left behind. Or he could be talking about a salvation issue that the hypocrites, you know, he could be talking about hell. It, it's not clear on who he's speaking about, but he's speaking about hypocrites. Okay, so if I want to be faithful and I don't want to be left behind, then we need to be praying as Christians as we see different moments of hypocrisy in our life. Lord, I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a Sadducee. I don't want to be a scribe. I want to, I want to really be a Jesus person. I really want to really be into Jesus and love Jesus and, and be honest about Jesus and be honest about my walk with God. It says, the master of the servant will come on a day when he's not looking. Cut him in two and point him with the hypocrites and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wow. Revelation 3, 9, it says in Revelation 3, 9, to know that I have loved you. The end of verse 9. Because you have kept my command to persevere. You have endured patiently through all your tribulation and your, your sufferings and your persecutions. 
You have kept my command to have faith and diligently seek me and then be rewarded. You've kept my command to persevere through this life in your faith. So guess what? So also then, guess what? I'm going to keep you. You kept yourself by staying with me, so I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world. It's coming. The hour of trial is coming. I'm going to keep you from it. I was just talking to a Christian the other day. Well, no, it says keep from. It doesn't say be raptured. Somebody who's connected with our church. No, it says keep from. You, okay, let, let's look at that for a moment. I will also keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. When you look up the keep from, it means that I'm going to protect you from the great time of testing. I'm going to keep you safe during the great time of testing. I'm going to protect you from the great tribulation and the temptations that will come upon the world. I'm going to... So, so what is God's safety hatch? What is his protection? Well, he says that he's going to take people in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And, and verse 11 of the um, Revelation chapter 3 says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, and that no one may take your crown. Don't let anybody take your reward. Hold fast. Hold fast to where you're at. Hold fast to your walk with God. Don't let anyone take your crown, your reward. Don't let anyone take it. Don't let anybody who creeps in through Satan in your life take it from you. Don't let anyone make you miss the rapture. Pastor John, Anthony, John Pride, George, Andy, Brittany, don't let anybody make you lose your crown. In the Bible, angels are used for deliverance. When Lot was in his house, the angels had, I don't know how they did it, but they grabbed the family by their hands and yanked them out of the house, and all of a sudden they're outside the city. They were in the city, in the house, and boom, the angels grabbed him and pshht. Okay? Um, Bible talks about the angels coming and dividing the wheat from the tares, all that kind of stuff in the, in the last days. Book of Revelation is all these angels pouring out judgments and everything. But with the voice of an archangel, the trump of God, the angels are used in the end times and in the rapture. John's story was, he heard the voice say, come up here. That's my personal belief always, ever since I was a new Christian. I believe that the trump of God, because you can have music like a voice. We had a demonstration, a science demonstration up here before, where they um, were able to, you, you can make a voice from a trumpet. And I, I believe that, you know, the angels taking them out, um, the voice of the trumpet, um, that we're going to hear those words, that at the rapture, it's going to be momentary, it's going to be spontaneous, but we're just going to hear, it's all going to pop into our heads at that moment, that same moment, every single one of us. This is what I believe. We're going to hear the words, come up here, and boom, we're going to be there. Boom, come up here. Just like John heard it, we're going to hear it. Come up here. Boom, we're all there in front of the Son of Man, in the presence of God. Wow. Genesis 19, verse 15, it says, When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. Wow. Wow. So you mean a believer, if they aren't heeding, it's possible? The angel did say that. It's possible to be consumed in the destruction of the city. It didn't mean that, that Lot would go to hell, but there was the possibility of him being under the judgment of God. Verse 16, and while he lingered, it says, the men took hold of his hand, 
his wife's hand and the hands of his two daughters and the Lord being merciful to him and they brought him out and set him outside of the city. Those were the angels of verse 15. Boom, grab their hands, boom, set them outside the city. We are going to be outside of the tribulation. The whole world is going to be in tribulation in order to be set outside of a tribulation of an entire world being on tribulation, we have to be put somewhere else. Now, however you want to look at that, I mean, in Revelation, it talks about the souls that are under the altar. <laughs> is going to, you know, whether it's the souls under the altar, wherever that is, wherever that place is, or it's standing before his throne on the sea of glass, we are going to be with the Lord. And then Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And after, it says, And after these things I look, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like the trumpet speaking with me. You ever have a trumpet speaking with you? Saying, here we go. Come up here. Got it? Come up here. Okay. And I will show you things which must, short, which, which must take place after this. And immediately, boom, moment, twinkling of an eye, I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Revelation 7 talks about a multitude being in heaven from every nation, tribe, people, tongue, standing before the throne of the Lamb. That's Revelation 7, 9. Um, whether those are some other group, but they appear in heaven. And then Revelation 7, 14, these are those who came from the great tribulation. They've washed their robes, scrubbed them clean in the blood of the Lamb. That's one thing that we need to know for sure to do, right? Scrub them clean in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 14, verse 1, and I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. The 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe, are raptured in the middle of the tribulation. So when people say the rapture is before, the rapture is in the middle, the rapture is after, actually, it appears that there's several raptures. And one of them is the two um, saints that could be Moses and Elijah. And it says that they are caught up to heaven and, and people watch them being caught up. So, so God does this caught up action on several occasions. It's kind of interesting. I, I want my caught up action to be at the, at the beginning. And um, first fruits to God. But what man can live and not see death, the Bible says in Psalm 89. Luke 2, there was a man, Simeon, who was told he wouldn't see death until he saw the Lord's Christ. That's um, Luke 2, 26. Well, guess what? Some of us will not see death, not until we see the Lord's Christ. We will not see death, and we will see Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, I need you to turn here with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. It says, now this I say, brethren, church, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. And other translation says we shall not all die, but we shall be changed. So if my body is a completely different body, and people say, some people believe about the rapture, that when the rapture happens, there's going to be dead bodies left all over. You're, you're not going to be raptured. That's impossible. It says we're not all going to die. So if your body was left dead, then the Bible would be wrong. Okay? It says we're not all going to die. So you're not going to be left here. You're, God's going to rapture your spirit, but your body's going to be dead on earth. Don't believe that. That's not correct doctrine. That's taught in a lot of our type of churches. Okay? That we shall not all die. It says, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. It's talking about a physical body resurrection, okay? 
But it's a, it's a transformation. It's an incorruptibility. It's a change that you don't have right now in your DNA. How do I know that this is really a physical resurrection at the rapture of some sorts? Even if that rapture right there was at the very end, how do I know that it's physical? Because when Jesus, in the, at the last couple chapters of Matthew, <clears throat> when Jesus rose from the dead, it says all the saints, the believers at that time, the Old Testament believers, got out of their graves and walked around the city. They all came out of their graves. The, the believers at that time, they were resurrected in bodies. So God is, God is taking this body and, and making it part of, it's a seed. And the seed is not what it shall be, but, you know, sometimes with people, oh, man, they're a hard nut to crack, right? Well, you know, some of us are some pretty tough seeds, but, but God's able to crack us open and, and, and bring his life out of us. And it says, I tell you a mystery, we're not all going to be asleep, we're all going to be changed. A moment, twinkling an eye, last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound dead and will be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and the mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of sin is death, or the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now there we go. What's, what is that victory? It's a victory over the flesh. It's a victory over your body. Romans, where it says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? God is going to deliver us from these bodies of death. He's going to transform these lowly bodies and make them resurrected bodies. But in the meantime, we need to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor isn't in vain in the Lord. We need to be seeking to overcome the world, and our faith is what overcomes the world. And so by faith, Enoch was taken away. Enoch lived 365 years. He was born 1,000 years before the flood came, about 35 years before Noah's birth. But do you know that Enoch, according to the book of Enoch that some scripture was taken from in the New Testament, but all of the book of Enoch was not accepted as, um, as scripture. And, but according to that, that book of Enoch, um, he mentioned about the coming flood. He knew, God had told him, if, if that's correct in the book. And it, basically, um, if I can read what it said, that he received a, a vision about the end times. And so he knew. And, and God could do that to us too. We can have this, this knowledge that it's the end times and that we're having visions about the end times. And that's what it said. And so then, from the book of Enoch, there's a section of that that was put into the book of Jude in the New Testament, where he warns people about being ungodly in the end times, and that the Lord is coming back with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on the ungodly. That came out of the book of Enoch, because that part was anointed, okay, to be used for us. And, and so there is something about Enoch that is special for us, and that's the book of Jude Verse 14 and verse 15. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Enoch was a man who stood up strong for God in his end times, in the vision about the flood. So if we're born again... That justifies God's wisdom in our life of overcoming sin and Jesus being the wisdom of God in our life. And so God, just um, according to Scripture, um, is going to be justified in our repentance. It says that in Luke chapter 7, verses 29 to 35. There's two Scriptures that use the word justified. That God is justified in the way that he does things, whether it be salvation or whether it be somebody like Enoch having a vision about the end times and being raptured. 
And then one more scripture to go look at in the Old Testament before we close is Genesis chapter 5, verse 21. Genesis 5, 21, it says, Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years. So you add up 365, it's 365. How many days are there in a year? So from the Gregorian calendar, his life, um, his entire lifespan in, in years represented the days of a year that we live in, in the end times, okay? Enoch walked with God that amount of time. So, and, and meaning, if he walked with God 365 years, that means we need to walk with God 365 days a year, right? So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Is that your testimony, that you walk with God? But he also had a son. What was his son's name? Methuselah. Do you know what the name Methuselah means? If I can find where I wrote it. But it means about, it has to do with God um, saying that there is going to be a flood. And that is what the, and I have it written down. I'm just scrolling and but wherever I put that, Enoch stood up, um, get born again, wisdom of God. Um, vision, Enoch intended regarding the end time scenario. Okay, so I can't find that particular piece of information for you. But, um, but Enoch was a man who believed in God's existence. He pleased God. He believed God was a rewarder of those who sought him. And, and he was raptured in his end times period. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. That's how we should live. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our God and Savior, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And Paul said, I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. Do you love God's appearing? And that you keep the commandment of God without spot and blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. And then one last um, verse here. Listen. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. It says, Now may God, may the God of peace himself sanctify you, like set you apart completely. And may your whole spirit, your whole soul, and your whole body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he who calls you is faithful who also will do it. There's something about your body, like how there was a dispute over the body of Moses, there's something about your body that, that it's, it's, it's corruptible, but God is going to use that dead body and, and somehow unite it with the new body he's making, and you will still be you, but you'll be perfect you. So Enoch was a forerunner and prototype and example of the rapture and somebody who wouldn't see death, somebody who got to be in the presence of God and transformed. And God did that to him, and God can do that to us as well at his appearing. That he was taken, he was transferred into heaven, he was exchanged from this earth to heaven above. Because he had that testimony. And you and I can have that testimony, even though we fall short. But we can also be well-pleasing to him. We can make it our aim to be pleasing to God. I hope that is all of our aim, to be pleasing to him. Okay, I know I took up some time, but um, usually on communion nights, we go about this long over, anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes over. So, so we're within the, the right time frame. So think about these things. There's so much about it. I hope that the rapture is salvation-based, but if it's not, and it just has to do with pleasing God-based, I, I want to do both. I'll hold on to my salvation, but I also um, want to be ready for the rapture if there's, you know, by not being a foolish virgin, but being the five wise virgins that have their wicks trimmed and their lamps filled.
Let's all ask God to fill us now, okay? Okay? Let's lift our hands. Okay, Lord, please fill us. Lord, that not one person at First Love Calvary Chapel would be left behind. That if the rapture were happening right this second, that Pastor John and every saint in this room would go in the rapture, Lord. That not one person would ever be left behind, Lord. That we would go in your presence, that we'd be taken. So Lord, please be that thief in the night for us. And Lord, let those angels grab our hand. Let us hear the trumpet of God say, come up here. Let us be taken, Lord. Let us be taken, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, we did it. We just did our little taken proclamation. Amen.